thank you so much for to the Broadbent Institute for inviting me to your progress summit. Um, so what I'd like to do is to talk about the kind of key thesis in my new book called Mission Economy and why I think it's really important today in order to make sure that the Build Back Better agenda is not just a slogan, but we actually have a way to deliver it. Um, and really, you know, the COVID-19 uh, moment is one that has woken the world up to just how badly prepared we are, whether it's to delivering personal protection equipment, to uh, delivering a test and trace system, to making sure that the digital divide doesn't prevent our young, our youth from actually accessing their human rights education, to making sure that the vaccine it's not enough just to have it. We actually need to make sure that it's globally accessible. So all sorts of problems uh, we're facing are basically ones that I think are really highlighting how we have a governance challenge. We have you know, states that have not invested enough in their public administrations. We have lots of companies that have been wed too long to the status quo of just kind of maximizing shares and profits. And we have problematic public-private relationships that really need to be unpicked and, and improved and restructured in really a revolutionary way if we are going to build back better. And for that, I think it's really important also to remember that this COVID crisis that we're living through is on the back of multiple crises. So the financial crisis, which again, in some ways, many countries have still not fully recovered from. We still have a financial sector that is mainly financing itself for example, um, but also we have, you know, the climate crisis. We should remember that the kinds of people that we were seeing on our television screens the February before uh, COVID became a household word were, you know, workers not in the health sector, but basically climate change fighters. So firefighters in Australia and in California, we had flood fighters, flood workers in, in Venice, which is the part of Italy where I'm from. So this climate crisis, again, is still there. Uh, we're not getting out of it quick enough. We had Greta Thornburg tell us when she was 16, she said, when your house is on fire, what do you do? You don't sit there and debate what to do, you get out. And we're simply not moving out of that crisis quickly enough. We're still you know, overly financing industries that are based on fossil fuels. We, even under the COVID-19 recovery funds, a lot of that has gone to problematic uh, sectors that are not transforming themselves. So one of the things I argue in the book is that we really need to kind of just pause and ask, you know, if Build Back Better is for real, what does that mean for the governance of public organizations, the governance of private organizations, and especially the governance of their interrelationship? And how can we actually build symbiotic, mutualistic partnerships, as opposed to what I increasingly see as, you know, problematic partnerships and predator-prey partnerships, parasitic partnerships. Um, and so what I do is I look back at the, at the moon landing, you know, 51 years ago now, and what it took to get to the moon was actually a lot of attention to all these different issues. You know, NASA was not just kind of, you know, putting money at a big project and hoping for the best. It actually really cared to think about how to design a partnership with business that would, again, be purpose oriented. And when Kennedy gave his speech in 1962 about, you know, we're going to go to the moon because it's hard, not because it's easy. The kind of language he used is simply not used today for any of the big challenges we have. The challenge at the time, of course, was the space race. It was beat the Russians, Sputnik, and so forth. But, you know, he, he also said very clearly, this is going to take experimentation and innovation, and we might fail along the way. And we're going to do it because it's hard, not because it's easy. We don't have politicians that really talk like that today. There's all this worry about the deficit, paying back, you know, the, the, the public budget once it's spent. And of course, there's lots being spent right now with COVID-19. And already, you know, countries are worried about how they're going to actually, you know, cut costs later in order to pay that back. There was none of that language. There was a lot of language about innovation, experimentation, public purpose, doing things because they're worth it, but also really doing it in partnership in partnership and that partnership was designed in a very particular way. And it, it's, it's quite incredible actually to think back to 1962 because they had no idea what they were doing. You know, they kind of made this claim that, that they were gonna go to the moon and come back within a generation. But at the time of making the speech, they still had all sorts of different ways that they thought they might get there. They finally landed on the idea of the lunar orbit rendezvous uh, a method. But you know, that took again, a lot of experimentation um, to even think about 
the different ways. And that, you know, along the way, Apollo 1, there's a fire and three astronauts died. And that, you know, trial and error and error, on the one hand, it produces tragic failure, but also produced then on the back of that failure, learning. And, you know, do we actually learn today in government? Are governments and public servants and civil servants allowed to fail, to do trial and error and error, or as soon as they make a mistake, are they on the front page of, you know, in the UK, we would say the Daily Mail. Um, and Gus Grissom, one of the three astronauts who died in 1967 in the Apollo 1 tragedy, just before dying, a couple hours before, he said, how the hell are we going to get to the moon if we can't even communicate between two or three buildings? That's because he couldn't hear what was being said to him. There was you know, real silos between the different departments in NASA. And on the back of that tragedy, they you know, made changes. They had George Mueller come in from Bell Labs. He set up these different um, uh, project manager teams. And the idea was that each team would have a leader, but they would be in constant communication one with the other, the different a, a program manager teams. And so working outside of the usual government silos, fostering dynamic, horizontal flexibility and agility became something they had to do if they were purpose oriented. Um, and, you know, along the way, uh, you know, they, they, well, first of all, they had to interact with business, a lot of businesses in a lot of different sectors. It wasn't just aeronautics. There was lots of investment in nutrition and materials and electronics. The whole software industry could be seen as an outcome in some way, you know, a spillover of the moon landing itself. Um, and there's lots of serendipity. So on the one hand, it was government led, but not government micromanaged. That would have killed the innovation. In fact, a lot of the innovation that came from the private sector around camera phones, athletic shoes, home insulation, baby formula, and again, the whole software sector, you know, happened because there was problems that had to be solved and all these different technologies and innovations were kind of solutions to the different types of problems. But one of the things I found most fascinating, which I just think has such relevance today, is you know that NASA again cared about redesigning their partnership with business. Today that's talked about in terms of purpose and stakeholder value. They didn't use any of that fancy language. They just said, okay, we've got some contracts here that are not gonna work. These are cost plus contracts where business can just charge us anything. Let's change those to fixed price contracts, almost like a prize scheme, but with constant incentives for quality improvement and innovation. Um, and in fact, it was precisely that kind of kind of clear goal, but open on the how and incentives to improve and to innovate that got us a lot of those spillovers that I just mentioned. But they also took care to make sure that it didn't all become a gambling casino. They had a no excess profits clause in the partnership with business. And, you know, all of all of this just shows that they were kind of confident, right? They knew their role. They knew they needed to partner with business. But the design of the deal, I think today we talk about the Green Deal, the deal with you know between the state and business was was carefully crafted um they also were quite uh, uh how do you say um attentive to the fact that if they within nasa stopped investing within their own brain so within their own research and development and over relied on the research and development of the private sector they themselves would not be a good partner to the private sector which is such an interesting concept they wouldn't know how to partner how to write the terms of reference or even know how to choose which business to partner with and so Ernest Brackett, the head of procurement, had a wonderful quote that I wrote down where he said, we need to be aware of brochuremanship. Uh, and, you know, if we don't have a brain, we're going to get captured by brochuremanship. And by that, he meant, you know, companies would be coming in with fancy brochures. Today, they would have nice PowerPoints. <laughs> um, and, you know, again, to know how to see through that and to actually really seek the right kind of businesses, the right kind of partnerships and so on, they had to understand their own landscape. And so what I argue in the book is that all these different lessons in terms of intra-organizational culture within the public sector to be willing to experiment, to be willing to fail, but to learn from that failure. So to be investing in that learning, but also to carefully craft deals, which are, you know, about sharing knowledge, about sharing resources, about also sharing the rewards that kind of no excess profits. And it's the word excess that matters. Of course, profits can be made. It's not a charity. You know, all those are really interesting lessons, as is the idea of, sorry, lessons for what? Lessons for solving the problems we have today, right? The sustainable development goals, climate change being one of the biggest problems we have. But again, the health pandemic showing us that so many different issues like gender parity and the digital divide really surface up at any time that we have such a, a, a huge global crisis. But it's also a continuous you know, set of challenges we face. And so the idea of kind of starting with the SDGs, 
the 17 sustainable development goals, which are challenges, they're not missions, turning them into kind of moonshots as ambitious as going to the moon and back in a generation, which involve as many different sectors as possible. Um, and then redesigning the tools that government has, you know, grants, loans, procurement, to really crowd in as many different solutions bottom up, so not micromanaged, to fulfill those goals is, is really kind of the approach that I'm advocating for. So, you know, turning SDG 13 around climate change into a mission around carbon neutral cities, for example, or the clean ocean uh, SDG 14 into a plastic free ocean over a limited amount of time involving as many different sectors from biotech, design, marine, chemicals, AI, and so on and then really crowding in those solutions across as many different actors as possible. That's very different from how we currently do policy. How we often do policy, for example, from an industrial strategy lens, is just making a list of sectors. You know, in the UK where I live, the, the list of sectors used to be, uh, what was it, automotive, aerospace, financial services, life sciences, and the creative sector. We decided these were our strategic sectors which were gonna get funding. Whereas this approach says, forget that list, it's a random list, there's many sectors not there. Think of the problems you're facing, whether it's clean growth, the future of mobility, healthy aging, you know, strengthening the ability of our welfare states to really govern data generation and data um, you know, ownership also in proactive ways. What does it mean to create missions around those? And it's an industrial strategy to then catalyze as much intersectoral and interactor investment and innovation to fulfill particular missions underneath those challenges that we have as a society. And no sector should really be kind of, you know, uh, not on that list. And that also requires, you know, putting what I call conditionality at the center of, of public funds. So instead of just subsidies and guarantees and recovery funds and bailouts, what does it mean to make sure that every penny, euro, pound of government money that does go to business is kind of conditional and business being part of the solution? Again, not micromanaging, not conditionality with a stick, very much with a carrot, but that means, you know, picking the willing, not picking winners, making sure that, you know, before bailout is given to the steel sector, this is pre-COVID, because steel is asking for quite a bit of money from governments worldwide, there's conditions like in Germany where they had conditions on steel reducing its material content in order to get a public loan. Or in France, what was interesting with COVID-19 was that the finance minister made sure that both Renault and Air France committed to reducing their carbon emissions before being able to access uh, the recovery fund. They just had to commit to it. They didn't actually have to do it yet. In Austria and Denmark, they made sure that companies that were avoid, uh, avoiding their tax through you know, a fiscal paradises, uh, fiscal holidays, uh, would, would you know, have to change behavior if they wanted to receive the recovery funds. Um, and this is also really important in how we govern you know, particular areas like health innovation. You know, you have huge amounts of public money going into drug innovation, medical innovation, vaccines, therapies like remdesivir. What does it mean to make sure the prices of those remedies, the accessibility of those remedies and, you know, different types of health innovations, the IPR, so the intellectual property rights, are actually governed with this kind of common good and public good perspective. Again, that means much more than just flooding the system with liquidity, it means governing it towards the public, uh, the public good. So, you know, my last point really is I just want to say that I think this is the time to do that, you know, because we do have trillions being poured into the system. In the financial crisis, we poured trillions in. Most of that went back to the financial sector. This time, we can't risk doing that again. It has to land on concrete structures. In the first place, our health systems, global health systems, but also I think in much more sound and symbiotic partnerships. Um, and that does mean, I think, that this is also an opportunity to kind of walk the talk of stakeholder value. This idea, which has come from the business roundtable, so large CEOs have been talking about this need to move away from purely maximizing share prices. But what does it mean to actually test that and to walk that talk in areas as, as specific as recovery funds, as specific as how we govern health innovation around the vaccine? Um, and I just think it's, you know, amidst this tragedy, it's an, it's an exciting time to rethink how we currently do capitalism. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you so much for those comments. And it's um, such a delight and an, and, uh, and an honor for me, actually, to, to, to be able to speak to you. Um, I, I've been following your work for some time. And um, I am particularly um, anxious to talk to you right now. I feel that, um, you know, in our, in 
national economy is a global economy. Um, we are very much at a point where, you know, governments are spending so much money to head towards recovery. Um, there's so much talk about Build Back Better, as you say, um, you know, very various competing visions of what that actually means. Um, could you talk to us just a, a, a bit about how we seize that moment or how governments should, should seize that moment at a time when there is also, you know, there is a, there are a lot of dreamers out there about Build Back Better and what that means, but there are also a lot of people who have been caged up in their homes for many, many months and just want to go back to the way things were. Right. Very good point and set of points. Um, so one of the pushbacks I get is, you know, fine, sounds great, but you know what? There's too many urgent things to do right now. You know, put aside that kind of luxury of thinking about the Green Deal now, let's just get, you know, cash to those who need it and so on. And I think that's that would be a huge mistake because we're simply then setting up the next crisis. So even just looking at it from a short-term perspective and the, the needs of companies and the needs of citizens today, if we're simply patching it up now, to face the same crisis later, you're definitely not making those same businesses or citizens better off. And you know that's why one of the things I always argue is we need a completely new framing instead of fixing what economists call, when they try to sound fancy, market failures. So the role of policy is fixing broken markets. Instead of doing it that way, what does it mean to co-shape and co-create markets that actually meet the kind of things that people want, right? I mean, people want you know, healthy food, they want non-polluted cities, they want their kids to go to school so they can work properly and so on. But a lot of those different kind of, you know, micro goals are part of grander ones around inclusion, you know, inclusive growth, sustainable growth and so on. So making sure that the Build Back Better strategy, for example, when it is composed of say an infrastructure component as, as President Biden's team is, really resisting this thing of just throwing a lot of bricks and cement, you know, in terms of infrastructure and making clear that it has to be green infrastructure or that, again, the kind of bailouts that companies need today are conditional on them becoming part of the solution. So again, green or more sustainable companies are companies that are paying the living wage or companies that are reinvesting their profits back into the people working inside the companies instead of just in areas like share buybacks. You know, this might sound abstract, but it's not. You know, when we talk about robots are taking people's jobs, it's not true. Robots have always taken jobs for the last 200 years, mechanization has. What we actually have since the 1980s is a lot of the profits being generated in the economy are not actually getting reinvested back into production, which includes people working in factories. So a lot of these issues that sound abstract, we need to actually ground them into what it means for people's training programs. Uh, again, the pay they receive, but especially the structures within which they work. And again, coming back to that kind of public-private partnership, how we structure deals that are not just handouts and subsidies, but truly are about creating a better society. So, you know, um, we've both been watching governments for a long time, and I feel that, um, you know, over the years, every time I see, every year I see a, a federal budget, and there is a lot of talk in every budget that I've, I've watched over the last 25 years, um, and probably before I was even paying attention, um, we've talked about, the government's talked about training and innovation and, um, you know, investing in ways to, to make the country more competitive and to make the workforce more productive and, um, you know, with some kind of far off concept of, of, of everybody's going to be better off one day. Um, it doesn't seem to ever deliver um, on, on, on those on those big on those big concepts, at least, you know, there's there are marginal improvements here and there. What do you think needs to change to actually, um, you know, to make good on on, on these concepts? I mean, th we you talk about the, the need to cooperate and, and, and between uh, the between governments and business. You know, we've been hearing that that every time they make an announcement, we hear that rhetoric all the time. Um, but it doesn't actually lead to any any um, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> occasionally leads to growth, but not always, and certainly not always uh, you know sustainable, inclusive growth. But I, I think there's reasons for that. So what I do in the, in the book is I actually mm -hmm. try to break it down into very very concrete steps. You know, I mean, the first thing is. If the kind of changes we think are needed remain just voluntary, even kind of ESG targets within companies, well, so what, right? I mean, you need to make it mandatory, it has to be transparent, it has to be standardized, standardized, it needs to be global. But also all the different funds that companies get, there simply is no evidence, in, and I know it's true in Canada, that we've ever even tried to make sure that they were conditional on transformation. 
funds are often given to sectors to stay into place. So if you said to me, look, we tried it, we actually, you know, gave money to, 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 to oil or gave money to automobiles and said it was conditional on them actually, you know, making certain types of investments and innovating, not extracting value out and making sure that their whole value chain became more sustainable and it didn't work. I'd be like, oh, really? Hmm, let's go look. But the truth is they never said that. <laughs> and in fact, Canada is a country, for example, that has overly emphasized indirect incentives from government simply through tax incentives. We know that that simply increases profits and there's no profits problem globally. Profits are at a record level. In other words, the profit share of GDP globally is at the highest it's ever been. The labor share is at the lowest it's ever been. That has not translated into greater investment. In fact, investment as a share of GDP has been falling. So how do you make sure that the profits being generated in business are A, reinvested and not extracted out, which is what often happens, and B, reinvested into directions that we need, broadly defined. Again, this is not about micromanaging what business does. We know that kills off innovation, right? So tilting the playing field towards the directions we want means actually designing the policies to do that. And the first thing is don't over rely on tax incentives. That simply increases profits. But tax incentives can be icing on the cake. So, you know, making sure that, that, for example, you're rewarding the kind of companies that are making the kind of changes that we think are important to reach the, you know, 17 sustainable development goals, but even specifically just if we focus on climate, we don't have that kind of tax incentive right now. So again, if you said, oh, we have this great tax incentive, which reduces taxes for companies that are greener and it's not working, then we should go look at it, but you don't have that tax incentive. So I think we need to be careful with, with pessimism because it's often then just kind of becomes almost anarchistic, like, oh, the whole political system sucks without actually looking at the policies themselves and unpicking why they haven't worked. And, and I personally think we often don't have the capacity and, and I don't want to say intelligence, but the capabilities within government to do this properly because we've stopped investing within those capabilities. We've outsourced government's brains to Deloitte, KPMG, uh, KPMG, Ernst & Young, you know, uh, uh, McKinsey. So that too really needs to be corrected. We need to invest more within the brain of the state. Yeah, I, I mean, so I found your book to be quite interesting on that or poignant on, on, on that point about the undermining of the civil service. It's undermining itself by um, it be, become very risk averse throughout the whole period of the Washington consensus, really, because they believed that they didn't um, have the... They, they didn't have the leeway to actually be creative about how to steer the economy. How do you get though from here to from here to there? Um, you know, does it? I would say it takes a lot of leadership. But where did you know leadership of a civil service? That's a that's a cultural thing that takes so long to to try to develop. Um, you know, do you have suggestions about how we can how a society could actually make that happen, or has actually maybe maybe some examples about how how it already has happened in some countries? Yeah, I mean, one of the things is you actually have to also invest in the idea that that's even important, right? So if we continue to think that at best the civil service is there to de-risk the risk takers and, you know, places like Silicon Valley, it's going to be hard actually to create that cultural shift. So I think, you know, it's really interesting to look at places like, um, like in Finland, they had Citra, Public Innovation Agency, or Vanova in Sweden, similarly, or Mind Lab in Denmark, where they actually explicitly decided to kind of increase the, the innovation within the public service, right? Actually to create, say, procurement policies that became part of your innovation policy. So instead of just having innovation budgets on one part of the economy and then everything else remained in place, every different government department, whether it's health, uh, uh, environment, you know, education, would use its procurement to funnel in new types of solutions to big public problems, but that itself required that kind of mind shift change of seeing government not just as a lender of last resort, a market fixer, an enabler, a de-risker of business, but itself a risk taker, an investor of first resort, and a shaper. Um, and once you do that, you start asking yourself those interesting questions like MindLab did in Denmark, which really was all about public service innovation. And too often we hear that we need to make you know public administration more nimble, more efficient, more cost effective, which ends up just being cuts to public administration as opposed to investments within it to become more dynamic. Look at Singapore as well. It's funny how some countries use Singapore as an example of the free market. It's actually a very active you know, government in terms of making sure that they are able to also kind of lead in particular areas without thinking that you have to kind of slowly just catch up. 
Um, if you look at, or, or I mean, if you look at how a lot of Southeast Asian countries have developed, they required very active policies, but also kind of a rethink of what was required within government in terms, again, of that intra-organizational culture. And unfortunately, in a lot of kind of advanced Western countries, we've kind of given up on government and then just come back to this ideological idea that, okay, we just need government to kind of fix and you know, set the rules of the game, but then please go away so all the dynamic Elon Musks can do their thing. When Elon Musk himself received $5 billion from the U.S. government, Tesla received a $500 million guaranteed loan in the early days, and none of that story or how to even do it better because these aren't necessarily all positive stories, none of that is kind of in the public discourse. We go back to wealth creators versus at best the welfare state kind of redistributing value. Mm -hmm. So the, I mean, COVID changes that though, right? I mean, COVID changes the, the, the value, I think that the society and even business has put on, on, on government. I mean, like in, in the great financial crisis, you know, the, the companies that were failing depended very much on what government did. And then in the case of pandemic right now, um, you know, the health, the health and, and welfare of, of everyday people depends very much on what government does. So I wonder if they have an opportunity here, but I also wonder um, if, you know, the pandemic has exposed um, so many of the, the the weak points of our society, you know, that the, there is a racial divide, um, there is a, a low, you know, in COVID hit low income people harder. Um, and, um, you know, when we talk about building back better, of course, we get into this whole green conversation, but I've watched our Canadian government in itself, you know, get into, okay, we've got to build back better. We've got to do, um, you know, make a, make ourselves a low carbon economy, but uh oh, we've got this whole inclusion piece over here and that they don't necessarily match up. So how do you pull those right. together? How do you choose your mission? I mean, if you've got like, I've just named five different missions. How do you, how do you, how do you do all that at the same time? Yeah. I mean, first of all, you know, areas like inequality or greening our economy, I, I really see those as kind of broad challenges that would fit under the bill of, you know, different types of ways to frame the SDGs. What I've been arguing is that if you stop there, then nothing happens. If you just talk about climate change or inequality or gender parity or hunger and poverty, you need to transform them again into these kind of, you know, moonshots and missions. And it's not me, an academic or one policy leader or one business that needs to set what that mission is. I really think it's also an opportunity to, again, co-create those missions in such a way that bring also citizens to the table. So if you have, for example, missions around carbon neutrality at the city level, you know, what is the role of, say, citizen assemblies in a city or housing associations if we're going to make sure that our housing estates actually are more carbon neutral? You need to bring people to the table. That's very different from the moon landing, which really could actually some, in, in some ways be kind of a technocratic experiment. Um, I've been uh, recently in London working with my local council, Camden, a part of London, with Georgia Gould, who runs Camden Council. We co-chair the Camden Renewal Commission. And we've been working in youth centers and again, uh, social housing as places where actually to foster dialogue between different actors on what the key problems are and what that then means for the redesign or the rethink of policies that exist that are spending money, but in really problematic ways that literally are just leading to kind of handouts to particular areas without that transformation that we require to solve those problems. I mean, I always go back to industrial strategy because it's actually come back with a bang after being a blasphemy for many years. But the danger in a country like Canada or in the UK is it literally just becomes this kind of list of top sectors that a country wants to invest in versus the transformation that we require in the economy and what is the role of all those different sectors. Coming back to the question of the digital divide in schools, so many kids, I'm sure this is true in Canada, of different social and economic backgrounds had very different access to their human right to education during the lockdown. What would it mean to use like really concrete missions and moonshots around reducing the digital divide to zero in terms of fostering lots of experimentation and innovation to solve that problem? That requires the government to be very attentive to again, how it designs things like procurement. Mm -hmm. It can't um, just be I'd like, like bringing bring... business to a sector. Yeah. Right, right. Fair enough. Um, I'd like to bring politics into the conversation here. Um, I've watched in, in, in Canada over the years, um, you know, various governments with um, various degrees of ambition on climate change. 
And as a result, we have had many, many different regimes uh, about how on earth we're going to cut our emissions. Um, and so they seem to change uh, dramatically with every change in government. And meanwhile, business, even if they're willing um, uh, to, to cut their emissions, don't have those benchmarks um, and the guidance and, and the market direction that they need to actually make it happen. Um, and so I wonder, you know, if we take that bigger and we talk about uh, uh, your, your concept of, of, of emission-based um, governance, how do you do, I mean, how do you do that without um, without having a disruption every time you have an election? And how do you get to the point where, you know, mm -hmm. you, in your book, you talk about President Kennedy having that buy-in from people and having that rhetoric, the astronauts that you quote about having that, uh, that, that, that support of the people, um, it was a very essential piece, right, to making that work and to having everybody behind it. I think we've seen it with vaccines too. Everybody's behind, okay, we've got to get those vaccines, but that's yeah. not necessarily the case with the broader, uh, with some of the missions that you talk about. They're quite controversial, um, at least I think probably in some sectors of the, of the, pop, of the, uh, of the, of the voting public. Yeah, I mean, I think you raised two really important points. One is how do you make sure this isn't just a pet project of a minister and that then you get another election and then there's a new mission and it just keeps, you know, just becoming a, a way to get kind of attention to one person's political kind of electoral strategy. And that's super important. That's why actually over 10 years ago, what I was mainly focusing on was what's the structure of public organizations that allows them to be public but not politicized, right? So even in Italy, for example, where I'm from, we had a very large state-owned enterprise called EDI, which actually was responsible for most of Italy's industrialization, but it had three different phases. One was public, not politicized. Top people were attracted to work in it. Another was public, super politicized, which every party had its hands in it. And the third was privatized. And the second and third were equally disastrous. <laughs> uh, and so that kind of first phase of public, not politicized, I think is actually the kind of structure that we have in places like DARPA, you know, which, you know, many people talk about, I talked about it in the entrepreneurial state, uh, a book I wrote some time ago, where, you know, DARPA, which came up with the internet, it's an innovation agency within the Department of Defense and the US government, brings people in for about five years, often from the scientific community, says very clearly, be bold, take risks, big bets around big public problems. The time they're there doesn't coincide with the electoral cycle. The, the organization itself tries to foster that kind of experimentation where you're actually rewarded for failing and for taking risks, which we're not when you're just worried about elections because you want to have your great success to tell citizens. So that's just one issue, which is the kind of organizational capacity around some of the issues you talk about. But the other is the citizen kind of buy-in. To be honest, there wasn't complete buy-in at all with the moon landing. There's, you know, the famous poem by Jill Scott Heron about, you know, Whitey on the moon. Why are we spending all this money up there when we have poverty and, you know, racism on earth and so on. And so it, it, it wasn't exactly perfect. And that's not what I talk about in the book. I'm not saying, oh, let's do everything that was on the moon. It's more to raise really difficult issues, including that one. What does it actually mean to do things that matter as opposed to just big projects, whether they're in the moon or on earth or whatever. And that's why I think the hardest thing that I think also we require new types of capacity uh, to do are, you know, that engagement piece. How, you know, how do you engage social movements, people of different types in a non-tokenistic way? So instead of just patting Greta Thornburg on the head at Davos and saying, oh, isn't it cute? A teenager cares about climate change. What does it mean? for governments to actually listen to social movements like Fridays for the Future, the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter. And I'm not saying it just, you know, in, in a kind of a politically correct way. I'm saying it because it really matters. We know capitalism has improved, has become more sustainable than it used to be, has become less barbaric than it used to be because of social movements, right? So, you know, we wouldn't have weekends. We wouldn't have the eight hour workday. Children would still be working in factories had there not been a labor movement. And yet we often don't hear about labor. Like we just hear about labor in defending itself, you know, labor unions defending themselves against something that might be seen as bad. But actually in the history of capitalism, labor unions were often on the front line making good things happen that otherwise wouldn't have. What's the equivalent today of the weekend, right? That that should, you know, that should be on the front line in terms of labor unions fighting for that we would all benefit from. And we all have often benefited from, you know, increases in things like the minimum wage that increase everyone's uh, uh, salaries. But I just think that there's something about going beyond the silos, going beyond the ideology, saying that government really should be about directing the system towards more inclusive and sustainable growth. But how it does it, 
there's that organizational piece I mentioned, but there's also that engagement piece, that co-design participation, but also social movement piece, which to be honest, I think is the hardest bit. And I'm not exactly an expert on it, but I do think it really, really matters. I have only time for one very quick question, and I wanted to talk to you about deficits. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah. in Canada, we are only recently come around to the idea that, that it's okay to run a deficit. Um, but the understanding is still very much that, okay, we need to grow um, our way. We, we need, to, yeah, the government needs to be involved in pushing growth, but it's got to grow. Otherwise, we're going to be saddling the next generation with, with uh, an unsustainable debt. So um, you take this on your book. Can you just tell us briefly, tell me, tell me I'm wrong. Tell me there's no problem there <laughs> with, with intergenerational, uh, you know, uh, uh, carrying the price. Yeah. So it depends. I mean, obviously spend, 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 don't worry about it would be stupid. <laughs> right. But so is save, <laughs> save, save, be careful, be careful, be careful, you know? Uh, so really, you know, I mean, let me just give an example. Again, I'm from Italy. Uh, Italy has a very high debt to GDP, but a low deficit. It has had a low deficit for years, often lower than Germany's. So if you're just cutting costs and you're being pressured to do so, as actually Italy and Spain and Greece were after the financial crisis, they were given support if they agreed to cut their deficit. And you're not actually making those bold public and private investments that we know are needed in order to foster long-term growth and increases in productivity, but also making sure that growth is sustainable. Let's just leave that bit out for now. Let's just talk about growth. Then the irony is your denominator is not going to grow, the denominator of debt to GDP, right? In fact, Italy's productivity hasn't exactly. grown for 20 years. And yet its deficit is pretty small. It's been between two and 4%. It's, it's not high. And it's often been lower than Germany's. So the ratio, just basic maths, when there's zero in the denominator, the ratio can actually go to infinity. <laughs> so even just that, like basic math lesson, let's just remember that, you know, a, a small numerator and a zero denominator can go to infinity. So stop obsessing about the deficit and really focus on long-term growth and the long-term drivers of that growth. And second, make sure it's sustainable and inclusive, what we were talking about before. Um, but the other thing is, you know, when we want to go to war, which countries do, no one ever says, oh, there's no tax revenue. They create the funds. So my book is really saying, do that always, not just create funds out of nowhere, but for your, your priorities. Instead of just waiting for you know, military priorities or pandemic priorities, and it's too late. By the time the pandemic comes, it's too late. You haven't funded your health service. How is it going to react? You know, what are our goals? So the whole point of a mission-oriented economy is to have an outcomes-oriented budget which again, it's not, oh, here's money to everyone. It's focus on the goal, backtrack, and think how to work out the budgeting, the financing, and the instruments. And the irony is if you don't do that, you end up actually spending more public money. It just ends up kind of raining down, as I said, in all sorts of subsidies, guarantees, and having no effect. So I think kind of those three points, or I'm not sure if there were two or three, but the first one, <laughs> um, you know, don't obsess about the deficit, you know, think about long-term drivers of growth and the direction of that growth in both the public and private sphere. Second, um, you know, we do create money for wars. Let's create money for the, the real social challenges we have. But third, do it in a smart way, right? Building what I talk about in terms of strong innovation systems, strong public private kind of flows, you know, science industry linkages and so on. And the multiplier effect for each of those kind of pounds, dollars, <laughs> euros of public money is much greater if you kind of get that system right, whereas if you just think of it as helicopter money, you know, let's just throw a lot of money at education, a lot of money at health, a lot of money at, you know, climate change without getting those details right, you're gonna have a problem. And, and by the way, inflation, the kind of risk of inflation when you have high public budgets is really there if you haven't then expanded capacity. If you're expanding right. the economy, then it's, th there's no reason to have inflation. Just think of it literally like, you know, I'm Italian. Again, I keep telling you that. I don't know why. But anyway, a fixed pizza <laughs> it's in terms of your, in terms of your, you know, economy. Um, and then you throw a lot of money on it. Each little bit of that pizza is going to have more money on it. So it's going to look more expensive. Whereas if it's, if it's expanding, you know, because of your investments and you throw down that money, it's sticking to different parts of the economy. There's no reason you would have inflation. So building extra productive capacity, expanding the economy, directing that expansion towards the goals we need. The first one definitely being climate change. So more sustainable economy, all sorts of new green digital services, new jobs and, and, and you know, materials that we need in order to do that. That can increase our growth trajectory and have a better direction of growth without kind of making our debt to GDP go out of bounds.
Fascinating. Thank you so much. It's been very inspiring. And um, you've, you've got you. my head full of thoughts about how we can, uh, how we could possibly uh, change, change things up here a bit here in Canada. So thank you. For and your I'm time. sure you're hungry too with the pizza example. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs>